This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. Benjamin Heinemann is the co-creator of Apache Mesos, an open source project that abstracts CPU, memory, storage, and other compute resources away from machines, enabling fault-tolerant and elastic distributed systems to easily be built and run effectively. Benjamin spent time as a lead engineer at Twitter, and he now works at Mesosphere. Ben Heinemann, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. In a talk that you gave, you began with a statement, you're building a distributed system, paraphrasing Mark Cavage. Before we dive into Mesos specifically, I want to get a feeling for how you think about the modern distributed system architecture. Sure, that's that's a great question. I, I think it's really interesting because right now, pretty much everybody is building a distributed system. I think that's that's that uh, Mark, Mark Havage article that you're referencing. Most people don't necessarily realize that they're building distributed systems, but it's pretty inherent in, in most of the, the software designs that we have today, whether it be because the applications we're building um, just need to be need to be able to handle lots and lots of, of traffic, so you, you need to spread them across lots of machines, or whether you just need to have many of them running at the same time to deal with failures. And so I, I think it's 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 kind of everyone's basically building a distributed system, even if perhaps you 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 don't realize it. And I think what's really interesting about that is um, distributed systems are not really taught <laughs> in most formal computer science educations uh, at, at the university that I went to for my bachelor's degree, the University of Washington, I think there was a distributed systems class if you were a master's student, and maybe they're starting to make that be a class for undergrads, but for the most part, that's not really taught. So most people kind of pick this up from uh, either their colleagues or books or web pages or whatever it is, and it's tough stuff. You know, it's it's kind of like parallel computing, except there's failures, so it's, it's even harder. Um, I, I think really where we're at with distributed systems today is is we're at a place where sort of, and I, I, I kind of have, have talked about this before, where we're, we're kind of at the place where you used to have to do your own memory management. And I don't mean like with C or C++, I mean like when you actually had to pick which regions of memory you wanted because the operating system wasn't providing any abstractions for you. Uh, and then eventually an operating system provided VMM, virtual memory managers, which made things a lot, lot easier. And that's kind of where we're at today with distributed systems. Pretty much everybody has to do everything manually, and almost everybody has to reinvent the wheel, uh, which makes all the, the distributed systems we build that much more brittle, that much harder to build, and uh, that much more likely to fail. So, so that, that's kind of where I think we're at today when it comes to distributed systems. Um, and that's great, because I think that, that that means there's a big opportunity to, to make building distributed systems even easier. So talk a little more about the analogy to virtual memory for, you know, because, you know, when we were just developing on single boxes and didn't have to deal with a distributed system, and then, you know, we got this idea of virtual memory and like, oh, it's it's great. Like, we don't, you know, you have this, you actually now have this wellspring of memory available to you, and it's it's all abstracted away from you. So talk a little more, more about that analogy and how Mesos acts like um, maybe the, the virtual memory uh, manager of the of the uh, data center operating system. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So um, I think I think right now th th there's some things that basically every every distributed system ends up having to to, to redo. So for example, if you are building something and you want to launch uh, uh, an application or a process. Um, on some other machine because you're distributed. For the most part, you're programming that up that up yourself. So you're you're figuring out, okay, this is the machine I want to launch it to. Um, either somebody else has launched another, you know, has, has has launched some kind of agent for me, or I even need to figure out how to first get my tasks or my processes to that that other machine. So that's one example. Another example is leader election. Pretty much every single distributed system has some notion. Not not every, but most have some notion of who the current leader is. Um, and uh, or who the current coordinator is, and to figure that stuff out, you really need to have some pretty sophisticated algorithms for actually determining 
who can be a leader. And, and of course, in the face of failures, this, this is even tougher. So there are some tools out there that help with that. There are things like um, Zookeeper and Etcd, um, and these can really help. Which is great. Which is great. That makes the problem much easier. But there's still there's still a lot of a, a lot of work that you have to do, and there's still a lot of tricky cases that, that you still have to solve when you're in, when you're using those systems. So that's another example. Uh, another example would be dealing with with failures. So um, what does it mean when I've distributed my work and I've got some some tasks on some machines and then those machines fail? Uh, do I actually know that the tasks have failed? Can I decide, uh, okay, that, that task has failed, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to launch another task reliably? Um, what happens if that machine comes back and actually my task is still running? Do I need to take care of the fact that I, I kill that task because I launched it on a different machine? So, so uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty typical problem in distributed systems. There's sort of there's the saying, you know, you want to make sure that you you shoot the other process in the head when it comes back, and dealing with that is is sort of a whole other aspect. So th that's just a couple, but these are the types of things that we really try to provide as an abstraction layer with with Mesos. So you don't have to think about how you're going to get your task to a different machine with Mesos. You just tell Mesos, hey, run this task using these resources. Those resources are tied to a particular machine, and then the ta and then Mesos takes care of getting the task there, starting the task up, watching the task while it's actually running on that machine. If that task fails, telling the distributed system, "Hey, this task has failed," or if the task, if the, if the whole machine fails, being able to determine, "Okay, hey, this machine fails." Telling the distributed system that machine has failed, so you can reschedule your task. And of course, of course, if the machine was actually just network partitioned away, then when uh, when when the machine reconnects to the system, Mesos makes sure, hey, I actually told the distributed system that this task was dead. So even though the task is still running, the machine was just network partitioned away. I want to make sure that I actually kill that task because I told the system that it was actually dead. So this is where Mesos really comes in as, as an abstraction layer where it provides these primitives that building a, somebody building a, a distributed system can take advantage of and kind of not have to, to rebuild that code themselves so they can focus, quote, I suppose, on their business logic, if you will, the business logic of the distributed system and not a lot of those, those other pieces. And sort of bringing it back to the virtual machine manager, really what this, what this, the goal of what this is trying to do is make people more productive. So make people be able to focus on just the aspects of their distributed systems they need to focus on. Not a lot of the plumbing that, that, um, that's really, really important, but not everybody needs to actually build. And, and that's really what, what operating systems and kernels really provide is they provide the abstractions that make it easier for people to build their software and build their systems without everybody having to build the exact same thing. And, I, you know, I, I think that the, the, the virtual memory uh, manager is, is such an interesting example because so many people actually never believed that uh, uh, the VMM would ever be successful <laughs> because there's no way that something could come in and actually abstract something like this away and still get good performance uh, or, or always be correct. Um, and so a lot of people, they were sort of like, no, 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 we're never going to use the VMM. That's that's not going to be something that's real. And computer scientists really pushed it and said, no, 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 this is this is the way that we should actually be abstracting this and, and running our software in the future. And now it's just something that we all take for granted. And I think that there's, there is some, some similarities with distributed systems as well. I think some people think, do we really need these levels of abstraction? Do we really want these? But I think that since this is kind of still, even though distributed systems have been along for a long time, the, the early days of distributed systems in the sense that more and more people are, are, are building these things every day now, I think that, that we will look back and we'll say, hey, yeah, there were a lot of abstractions that we needed to put in place that really, really sort of helped us and, and, and made us more productive and made our code safer and, and crash less and more, more robust. Yeah, and one, one thing I think about as a, a total example of this is like when, when I was in college, I, I did take an undergraduate class in distributed systems, and the entire class was about you know, like Paxos and like proving and right, like writing proofs that your like distributed system was, was fault tolerant or, uh, you know, if like you, you handle all the error cases and whatnot. And I was like, holy smokes, just building a distributed system is the worst thing in the world. I never, ever want to do this. Yeah. And, and, and none of the class was about actually leveraging the distributed system. It was all about like, here's all the things you have to do in order to ensure that a distributed system actually works. Yeah. And yeah. but but since coming out of college and like you know doing some of these shows on just some of these distributed system applications, like oh this is so this is once once you get this 
this stuff out of the way, these problems out of the way, it becomes awesome. Like you, act, you can actually leverage this stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you were when you were working on Mesos, what were the the ideas that that you wanted to be able to leverage once you had these these problems abstracted away? What are the what are the solutions that you wanted Mesos to make available to programmers? Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. So, um, wh- when we started the project, uh, what we were really focusing on that on at the time was Hadoop. <laughs> And what we really wanted to, to enable was being able to, really two things. One was run multiple Hadoops at the same time. That was actually, that was our, our, our initial goal. Because we, we were running a lot of Hadoop at Berkeley. Um, we were doing a lot of research with Hadoop. Big data analytics in, in particular um, uh, was and still is a pretty hot topic. We Yeah, so we basically just wanted to enable a way to be able to run multiple Hadoops. So, so why did we want to run multiple Hadoops? Uh, well, a couple of reasons. One, we wanted better uh, fault isolation between the the Hadoops that we're running. Um, so rather than when somebody ends up running a job that triggers a bug in one of the Hadoops and crashes that Hadoop and all the Hadoops go down, uh, we wanted to be able to say have like a production Hadoop that was running where the only jobs that ran on that were jobs that we know we've run for a long time and always work. And then we wanted to be able to have an experimental Hadoop where anybody from, from the lab could basically just submit their own MapReduce job. And uh, who knows what that's going to do, if it's going to bring down the cluster, if it's going to suck up all the resources. But that's okay because that independent Hadoop uh, was not going to affect the, the production Hadoop. So, so uh, just sorry to interrupt, but uh, you're saying multiple Hadoops sort of on the same file system or on the same, like that's running exactly, on the same data set? That, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So take, you know, the nine machines we had in our, in our cluster and and basically say, okay, I'm going to run a production Hadoop and I'm going to run an experimental Hadoop instance on these same nine machines. And But we wanted to do it in a way where we said, well, rather than taking these five machines for the production uh, instance and these four machines for the experimental instance, what if we could do it in a way where when the production instance needed five machines, it made sure that it got all five of its machines. But when it didn't need those five, when say it only needed two, then the experimental Hadoop could use the other seven. So we could really dynamically and elastically move the resources between the, Hadoop, the, the production Hadoop and, and the experimental Hadoop. And so that's that's kind of where it started. And, and we were really focusing on sort of cluster managers of the past because there's been a lot of cluster management and resource management research that's happened. Uh, in fact, projects like like PBS, the portable batch batch system, uh, dates back to I think 1991. So you know this wasn't new stuff, and, and grid computing had been around for a very long time. And so we, we were really looking at at cluster managers of the past and saying, okay, well, could we use these things to sort of achieve our goals of running multiple Hadoops at the same time? And uh, uh, we realized that that no, there was there was a lot of opportunity to make the idea of a cluster manager uh, much much better. And in sort of doing this, we realized, hey. If we're going to be putting this level of abstraction in place in between, you know, the the, the machines that are actually running and the, the distributed systems, the the Hadoops on top that we're, that we're running, could we also then make it even easier to build new distributed systems? Since kind of the, the, that that was the, the the genesis of of where we said. Wow! Yeah, if we put this 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 level of instruction in between, we can also provide these primitives to make it really really easier to build other distributed systems. And that's why the uh, one of the very first distributed systems that we built on Mesos was Spark. So uh, Spark, which is now also an Apache project and is is really popular for big data analytics, was a distributed system that we built actually in about a week on top of Mesos. And, and it was kind of, it was sort of the pet project or whatever that, that term is, but the example, the, the pet example of, hey, yeah, here's how you could build pretty easily a distributed system on... Spark is on- a streaming processor, right? Yeah, uh, so it does streaming, it does streaming, but it also can do um, uh, MapReduce-like, uh, batch-like workloads as well. The, the really cool thing about Spark is that when we were building it, we decided let's put everything in in memory. So when you do your computations, what, often what was the case with MapReduce is you you run one iteration of your job and it would read everything from disk. It would it would do the crunching and it would write this stuff back to disk. 
And then when you go to do your second iteration of, 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 of your job, you'd have to read everything from, from disk again. So what we said with Spark was, hey, why don't we, when we run jobs, why don't we keep the output in memory so that when you run a second instance of your job, it can read the stuff from memory again, which is going to be far, far faster. So we could do these iterative jobs, which were really, really typical in machine learning applications, uh, you know, 100 times faster than, than, than you could do it on Hadoop because we'd actually keep stuff in memory. And, and so, but really, I, I think what was so interesting for, for us at the time was, hey, here was this new distributed system that we whipped up that was, you know, fault tolerant and highly available, and we could run it across thousands of machines, uh, and it was like a thousand lines of code or something like that. And of course, Spark has evolved considerably since that day, but a lot of the core functionality, the idea of, you know, to put this stuff in memory and running it, that really, really came from that that first thousand lines of code. So that was that was kind of uh, uh, where sort of where, you know the history of the project where it came from, and you know your, your question was about sort of uh, uh, what did we want to you know really enable uh, when when we were you know the solutions we were trying trying to enable when, when we first started working on the project, and I think the first thing we were trying to do is just hey how how can we really effectively use resources across multiple distributed systems on the same data center on, on the same set of resources at, at the same time, the same set of machines at, at, at the same time, and that really evolved very, very quickly into, whoa, if, 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 if the way that we solve this is kind of kind of like a cluster manager, you know, but again, it's, it's, a, it's very much an evolution of cluster management, then we can at the same time uh, provide this abstraction layer or these primitives for people to build other distributed systems. And that really opened the door into, wow, there's a lot more things that we really want to enable here, not just people running Hadoop or batch analytics, but people running, uh, running, running and building whatever distributed systems they really wanted to. Uh, and again, we were really thinking about analytics at the time. So we were thinking about MPI, um, which is the message passing interface, which is still used pretty heavily in national labs and at universities. And that sort of evolved. And then we started thinking, hey, we could just run, we could run stateless services. We could run web servers. Uh, we could run web services. Uh, we could run anything that's kind of in the service-oriented architecture uh, realm. And that's when Twitter actually really, really picked up Mesos was that when they said, hey, wow, uh, we could, we, we are, they were interested in decomposing uh, their application into s something like a SOA. And they said, wow, we could use Mesos to then run all these, these uh, services. And that evolved into not just services, but also memcaches and Redis's and Jenkins <laughs> for doing your, your CI um, and, and your testing and, and your build and pretty much more and more and more uh, applications. And it just sort, sort of sort of evolved and, and, and to the point where we said, yeah, you can pretty much run everything on this. You can run all your distributed systems. And, and that's how we really think about, about, about Mesos and uh, what we're doing at Mesosphere today is enabling you to run any distributed systems, uh, any applications, uh, just somewhere in your data center. That's great. Yeah, so I want to get into the uh, the message passing interface and the the nuts and bolts of of how Mesos is implemented. But before that, I want to talk a little more about some examples of how Mesos is being used to give the listeners a finer understanding of just a, a continual iterate, reiteration of, of what exactly are the, are these problems that Mesos is solving. You, you know, you, you spoke about Twitter. Maybe you could give a, a finer explanation of Twitter's like set of problems they had when they looked at Mesos, and, and maybe we could contrast how these sets of problems that Twitter would have been solved without Mesos and how they would have sol been, and how they actually got solved with Mesos, so, sort of to, to contrast the degree of the value add that Mesos is providing. Sure, sure. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. So in 2010, I was asked to, to come over to Twitter and, and give a talk. In fact, the entire team that was working on it at, at, at Berkeley at the time went over and we gave a talk. And we spoke to sort of the, the sort of the, the researchy group at Twitter. And there was a bunch of folks there that had come out of Google. And at Google, they were used to using a technology that, that's called Borg at Google, which is a, their cluster management system for running all their, their applications. And Twitter at the time was a monolithic Rails application. And most people call it internally the monorail. Uh, and it was a giant... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's great. It's, it was a great term, yeah. Uh, and, and so this was this giant Ruby on Rails app uh, that was really really, really tedious to bug, really tough when you modified it. Uh, oftentimes you, you, would, you would cause some other part of the code base to crash or to not work correctly. And so for lots of reasons, Twitter decided that the right thing to do was to evolve away from this monolithic Ruby on Rails application to SOA-based 
based system, so a service oriented architecture based system. So lots and lots of these smaller services that a lot of folks are calling microservices these days, and having all the services communicate in concert and provide the same functionality that was being provided in this giant monolithic Rails application. So when you think about sort of Twitter's deployment problem in the past, and it was still great, it was still a, a significant deployment problem because of their scale, they had to run thousands, tens of thousands of these Ruby servers. So it was still a really, really tough problem, but there was pretty much one thing that you were deploying. You know, you were deploying just this this Ruby app, and maybe depending on what version of it you were deploying, uh, there was some complexity there, but it was really, you know, one app, one way to actually deploy it. Uh, and when Twitter started to evolve into to SOA, it went from one app to five apps, to 10 apps, to hundreds of apps, and to thousands of apps. <laughs> and the problem just became much, much tougher because uh, the other thing that evolved at Twitter was it, it went from being Ruby to uh, Ruby and Java, to Ruby and Java and, and Scala, <laughs> to Ruby, Java, and Scala, to some Python. Uh, there's a little bit of C++ there. So uh, the problem just became uh, significantly harder when it came to the operations team to basically keep up with how they could manage deploying all these different services. And uh, it's a tough problem to scale with humans because basically if you had humans managing the deployment of all these services, you kind of have to have a bunch of people per team. So they really saw Mesos as this opportunity to be able to have this layer where the teams themselves could actually be responsible for deploying their applications into their, their data center. In Twitter's case, it was a data center, but the same applies if it's a cloud, just, you know, a bunch of machines, whether they're virtual or physical, that, that's, you know, your data center, a bunch of machines. And Twitter really, really saw an opportunity to use Mesos to be this, this fabric to actually do that deployment and let the teams do it instead of actually having to uh, have large operations teams managing all of this. And I think what Twitter was doing at the time, uh, so, so you asked about sort of contrasting the, the Mesos approach from what Twitter was doing at the time. What they were really doing at the time was they were using a, a lot of Puppet, and Puppet was being used to basically say, okay, on this machine, I'm going to set this machine up to be used for this application, and here's how everything gets set up. And that, there was a lot of, of manual work there, and then it was also kind of creating these very, very static partitions where, again, it's, there's that same same problem that I had mentioned with, with Hadoop, where you're really only running one application per, per machine, which meant that you either needed to buy that machine to precisely fit the application, which was really, really hard <laughs> because, you know, the amount of resources that the application needed, who, who knows how many resources it needed from the day that you started the application, which was usually when the capacity request went in for the, for the machines, to the day that the application was actually finished and you could run the application. So I think when I first got, got to Twitter, I forget how many, but there were probably something like 10 to 15 different SKUs for machines that were being purchased which also made the operations even tougher because there's so many different kinds of machines with so many different pieces of hardware that had to be managed. Um, when one thing failed, you didn't have just a surplus of, of all those those replacements for that machine. You had, you know, just you had to go and potentially buy a particular replacement. So the, the whole thing, Twitter and my team, we really realized, okay, we could streamline this. And we could make it so, you know, you could buy far fewer SKUs. The responsibility of the capacity teams would be just making sure there's enough capacity to run all of Twitter, all the different applications. The responsibility of the Mesos and uh, uh, the Aurora teams, and Aurora was one of these distributed systems that we built on top of Mesos for actually deploying and running all these applications. The responsibility of those teams were to um, to go ahead and actually schedule the tasks across all these machines, schedule the applications across all these machines, make sure they kept running in, in the face of failures. And then the machines could just kind of get plopped in the, in the cluster. Uh, and then once they, get, they, they got dropped in the cluster, they got hooked up, all of a sudden they became available resources. We would just schedule across those resources. Uh, the, the operations team no longer needed to coordinate with all the application developers on when the machines would show up, when they were ready to be used, uh, application developers just launched their applications, whatever available resources in the cluster would get used, even if 
the available resources they were using were not, in fact, the resources that had been slated for them in the capacity planning. In fact, that often was not the case. It was often the case that you would do your capacity planning for the amount of resources you needed for your application, but you'd be able to start running your applications immediately because we would just have excess capacity in the cluster already, which is great. So, you know, you could start testing your distributed system immediately. You didn't have to wait months for, for machines to actually show up. Eventually, those machines would show up and they would kind of act as the available capacity resources for the next next team that was trying to figure out you know its its application or t- trying to build its application and and then of course the other big advantage was when we wanted to do maintenance on the machines, we again didn't have to communicate with the application developers and say, hey, uh, I, in the old days, the way it used to work was since you had the static partitions where you, you, you used Puppet to fix the applications to those machines, when you wanted to do any kind of, of maintenance on those machines, you'd have to go in and you'd have to actually tell the application, uh, the application teams that were running their apps on those machines, hey, I need to do maintenance on some of your machines, so I'm going to be killing some of your, mach- your machines. And uh, which means you're going to have less capacity for running your applications or they'd have to figure out some kind of dance to figure out how they could have extra capacity during the time that they were doing maintenance. Uh, uh, And now you wouldn't even need to do that. What you could do instead was the ops folks could just go in. They would just be able to kill uh, whatever jobs, what we called actually drain the machines. They could drain the machines so those applications would get relaunched somewhere else in the cluster. And then once the machine was drained, they could pull it and do whatever, whatever maintenance they wanted to do, whether that be software maintenance or hardware maintenance. And so that, that uh, at Twitter, that was sort of the, the evolution of the way that sort of sort of why there was that evolution. It was really the, the movement to SOA and then um, sort of the, the big advantages of, of that evolution from having to do so with something like Puppet or Chef or, or, or one of these other tools. Right, and, this, it, and this sounds like such a relief of a huge pain point. And so let's let's dive into an example a, a little deeper. So, for example, let's say um, it's noon uh, PST. And, uh, you know, Twitter's getting all, like all this lunchtime traffic and they have to spin up a new instance of the application, maybe. Um, so what what's going on under the covers? Is is there some kind of load balancer that like detects something and then it submits a request to the to the Mesos uh, world or what, what exactly would would happen there in order to in order for um, the new application instance to get the memory that it needs? Like what's going yeah. on under the covers? Yeah. So so. Uh... There's there's a couple different things. Um, it depended on the application at Twitter, but basically, in a nutshell, it, we had an alerting system which would tell you the amount of resources that were being consumed by any application and and sort of the SLAs that it was actually actually making. And then, uh, to depend on the application, either either human would go in and say, "Hey, I want some more instances," uh, and then it would use Aurora. And again, Aurora, as I mentioned, is sort of this service scheduler for um, that that we built at Twitter. And it's it's kind of it's kind of the pass interface at Twitter. The, the, the platform as a service interface. It's what the application developers use at the end of the day to actually launch their applications, um, and and they they kind of describe their applications in this sort of this Python this Python esque um, configuration language, and they 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 give that to Aurora, and then Aurora gives that to Mesos in order to then launch the tasks somewhere in the data center where there's sufficient resources. So yeah, if 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 there was a spike of traffic, oftentimes this would occur, say when there was a big news event or something, then a team could have their application instances immediately scaled up to whatever free resources were available in the cluster. And so sort of the, the way that we would, we would guarantee that there were enough resources for these applications is we had this concept of quota in the system and you, you would have production quota. And so you were, all, you were always guaranteed that there was going to be capacity in the system to be able to scale up to, to that production quota. And uh, if that meant that we needed to preempt or revoke resources from, from some other applications that were running, then, then we would do that. Uh, and the reason why that's okay is because I think something that a lot of people don't really realize is there are a ton of things that can get run in these data centers that consume resources that you can really easily kill. So that's everything. For, that's what a lot of people typically think about, which is analytics. In fact, analytics might not even be the best example because it's, sometimes you can't kill analytics because uh, it's really important that those analytics jobs finish because they're doing things like showing stats on your on your to your users about say how many people are are retweeting their tweets or how many people are are following them or you know the the amount of engagement that they have with a particular group of people or in Twitter's case as well producing stats like the number of people that participated in a TV show <laughs> last night because of their tweets. Uh, so some analytics jobs are actually critical production jobs. 
but there's a ton of other jobs that are actually running in the, the data center that you can take resources from. Things like build and test. You can use all these resources, these free resources, when they're not being used for, say, your production front-end traffic for running build and test. All the test jobs that you're running, other, you know, arbitrary uh, things that people are just trying out. So yeah, so so we could preempt those resources. We could rope those resources if we needed to, and make sure that the production jobs would would get their resources so they could serve serve whatever traffic. And again, uh, the way that that worked really depended on the application, uh, whether it was done automatically or whether the application team itself would just go in and say, "Oh, I need another five instances. Push a button, and then then they'd get those instances." Okay, cool. And so. I guess talk a little more about the in-depth relationship between different machines that you have spread under this Mesos fabric. Like what um, what are the, what are the different roles that the machines are playing? You know, you have a master, and you have um, I think what it, uh, is it executors and and schedulers. Yeah, yeah, sure. That, that's great. Yeah, Mesos is is sort of it's an incarnation of what in distributed systems we've traditionally called the master-slave architecture. So what that means is that there's a, a, a master process and there's master nodes really and then there's the worker nodes which are responsible for actually managing all the tasks that, that get launched. And this is where the notion of leader election is really important because if something happens to the master you have to elect a new leader to be the master. Yep, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So uh, when you, when you run Mesos, you typically run uh, three to five masters, um, depending on the the level failure that you want to want to actually be able to handle. And then you run whatever number of, of nodes you want that actually connect to the master. And the machines themselves that you're running the Mesos nodes on, those can be as homogeneous at or as heterogeneous as as you want uh, 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 you know you don't have to make them all be eight core 16 gigabyte <laughs> machines you can have some that are 32 core 128 gigabyte you can have some that are two core eight gigabyte uh, you can really mix and match because again the goal of mesos is to just provide this big pool of resources across which you want to run all these tasks. So uh, I, I, I say that because you can really organically kind of grow your cluster. You can take whatever machines you have, put them together in a cluster, and then evolve that if you want to something that looks more homogeneous per per machine, or you can keep it as heterogeneous as, as you'd like. And then they all connect to the masters, uh, and the masters, at the core of the master is what's called the allocator. And the allocator is what's what's responsible for uh, knowing about all the tasks that are actually running in the system and knowing what resources are free and available and being able to then allocate those resources to the distributed systems that are actually running on top. So um, uh, uh, so an example of one of those distributed systems is Aurora, as I mentioned. Um, uh, we have uh, at Mesosphere, we have something that's very similar to, to Aurora called Marathon, um, which again is sort of responsible for running these, these long-lived stateless stateless services. And so, so in these distributed systems that are on top, the Aurora and the Marathon, they have a scheduler inside them. They themselves are, are what we call a framework. We actually use the word framework instead of distributed system um, <laughs> in Mesos to describe these things that run on top. And every framework has what we call a scheduler, which you can really think of as sort of the distributed systems coordinator. It's the thing that's trying to decide what tasks to run and where based on whatever resources can get allocated to it. Now, we called it a scheduler for a couple of reasons. Um, first, if you kind of think back to the fact that we were really sort of trying to build something um, with this operating system perspective and we wanted to enable these distributed systems to be able to, to schedule their workloads or schedule their tasks, that's kind of the crux of what is in one of these distributed systems. That's why we actually call it a scheduler. I, th I think some people, they sort of, when they hear the word scheduler, they think, whoa, <laughs> to build a scheduler, I need to have a PhD in, in computer science. But it's really, it's, 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 again, that's the business logic of deciding what tasks you want to run, when things fail, what other things you might want to do. Um, so that's, that's the, the scheduler component. And so it gets, it gets what we call resource offers, which are allocations of resource. They're an offering of resources that the, the distributed system can use to actually run its application. And those those allocations come from the allocator that I previously mentioned that runs in the master, and uh, and it can also come from requests that specifically come from this from the scheduler uh, or constraints that it needs to actually get solved in order to run its applications or its tasks. So just just to put a finer point on it, could you give a vocab definition for? For, uh, what a framework is and what a scheduler is and what an executor is? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, a framework is really just a distributed system that runs on top of Mesos. And the scheduler is the component that communicates directly with Mesos and is given resource allocations, which it uses to decide which tasks it wants to run throughout throughout the data center. So the task in Mesos, it's really the thing that we run. It's the thing that consumes resources, and it's the thing that that tells us what to do when we actually get this thing to an application. Do we run, you know, is it a binary? Is the task represented as a binary? Is it a, is it a shell script? You know, is it a shell command? Is it a Docker image? These are all, you know, different ways that we can actually run your tasks. And so you give us, you know, some thing and then, and then we actually run that. An executor is actually, uh, it's an optional component of a framework. You can think of, 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 a, of a Mesos framework as really primarily being a scheduler launching tasks. But it can also be a scheduler launching tasks, which are then executed on the individual machines via an executor. So if you don't want to, you know, if you want to just give us a, a, a Docker image or you want to just give us a binary and you want to say, hey, this is how you run my task, we can go ahead and we can just run your task for you. But if there's something that you would like to do that's particular to how your task gets run and you can't code that up into our, our, our model, then what you can run instead is called an executor. And then we'll pass the task to your executor and say, hey, hey, here's the task that your scheduler had told you you want to run. You're the responsible for, for figuring out how you actually want to run it. So you can think of, you know, there's a lot of distributed systems that really fit this executor model. Um, there's, uh, there's things like, like Hadoop, which has the notion of a task tracker, uh, which is the thing that's actually running all the machines, which is running the maps or the reduces, tracking them, and then reporting their status. So that fits the executor model really well. There's also things like Spark, as I mentioned, which fit the executor model really well. But again, it, not, not every, not every distributed system needs an executor model. This is just if you actually need it, uh, uh, you have that functionality in the system. So that's, that's really the core pieces. Uh, there's a framework which runs on top of Mesos. A framework has a scheduler. Scheduler runs launches tasks and if you want to sort of define how those tasks get run then you also implement an executor and then in order to for these different things within mesos to be communicating you have calls and events which is uh, a message passing syntax which uh, is in contrast to for example request response so wh what's the difference between call slash event and request slash response like what why, why did you choose uh, the message passing syntax and, and how is that actualized in a, uh, a, a Mesos application? Yeah, great. The reason why we chose to actually build the system in a very actor-based message passing way is because it really forces the person that's actually building the, the distributed system to think about the cases when there are failures, to think about what happens if messages don't make it through, to really realize that you can't assume this very synchronous nature of request response that always occurs. So that was the, the, that was kind of the, kind of the kind of the first reason. So so a call in in in, in Mesos is, is is a one way message send to the Mesos master to say, hey, um, you know, this is something I'd like to do. And then an event is a one way message send from the Mesos master master back to a scheduler, which says, hey, here's something that has occurred. And the other reason why why we want to introduce this is because uh, there's this concept of in Mesos of events actually occurring uh, that don't come from the you know that they're they're not something that you would get from doing request response. They're just things that get generated that we need to actually send back out to schedulers. So there's there's an event stream, if you will, of things that are constantly happening. For example, your task has just failed. A machine where you're running tasks has just died. There are more resources available that we'd like to allocate to you. Uh, so here you, you can use these resources. So these are just asynchronous things that are occurring. And so we really need, need, need to be able to just push these things out. But again, we need to be able to push these things out. Some of them we want to guarantee that we always push them out in a reliable way, such as a status update for, for your task. We want to make sure that you always find out about that status update. And other things we want to push out uh, in just sort of a best effort way, which is, hey, we tried to make this allocation to you. If we haven't heard back from you within some period of time, we're either going to reallocate it to you or we're going to, we're going to allocate it to somebody else. And it's okay. You know, your distributed system itself might be down at the time that we're trying to push events to you because, for example, maybe your distributed system failed, your scheduler has failed, and that's okay. You know, that, that happens because fail, failures occur or the machines where your, your distributed system is running have happened to crash. And again, that's okay. We're not going to assume that because you have crashed, all the tasks that you've launched should also get killed. We're going to keep them running. We're going to assume that 
that failures happen. Um, right. so, so you're saying, so you're saying, in contrast to the request response model, uh, the problem with the request response model is in a distributed system, you're going to have some failures and stuff. And so, so when you, if if, if every time uh, one machine makes a re makes a request to another and is expecting a response, and you're maybe you're blocking on that response, it just creates all sorts of bottlenecks that you don't have if you have the the call and event. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, building out a synchronous request response distributed system these days is also, you know, one that scales is a very, very, very tough proposition to, to actually make because of it, of it consuming all these resources to deal with the blocking calls. So really, I think if you think about even just on a single machine today, if we want to take advantage of the hardware and be as performant as possible, we need to do things in an asynchronous way that really pushes this idea of message passing. Uh, and then that applies equally as well to the distributed systems arena where the systems are obviously, of course, distributed and this asynchronous message passing is really valuable. Um, and so we just capture that in the entire system. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't put abstractions on top of asynchronous message passing to make things look more synchronous or make, th make things look more request response. And plenty of folks have done that. That's just not the core of what, what, what we actually expose up. So I want to ask a broader question. We're starting to get all these like building blocks of distributed systems. We've got all these like Apache projects, you know, Kafka, Storm, Zookeeper, and uh, Mesos. You know, is something that lever is is leveraging uh, these. You know, for example, it's leveraging Zookeeper to do some leader election. Um, and then you know, you've also got like got things like Docker. And so where like where are we going? Where what is the what is the bigger picture of what what does a distributed system look like in three to five years? Yeah, that's I mean that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I mean the, the the building blocks are also really interesting because we're starting to get duplicates of the building blocks, right? We've got we've got Zookeeper, but we've also got etcd. We've got plenty of different message queue systems out there. We've got ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, got some some more modern replacements of PubSub like things, um, Kafka's and these, and and so we're starting to get a lot more of these things uh, as well, and. Where I'd like, how about I answer the question about where I'd like to see the future go? Because <laughs> I, I think many potential futures, but where I'd really like to see the future of all these distributed systems going is where we can start to figure out the POSIX interface to all these abstractions, if you will, these primitives that you'd expect should be provided in a distributed or for a distributed system so that I can just build my application assuming that I have a, a service like PubSub or a service like a message queue or a service like coordination or a service like like leader election. And I can just build it against this interface. I can build my, my distributed system against this interface. If in a you know if in one organization they choose to use Zookeeper, that's totally fine. And if in another organization they choose to use etcd, that's totally fine. I can run my application in both places. And that's that's what we don't really have today that is, I think, really, really critical for going forward for, for our industry as a whole to be able to be able to reuse all these systems that, that we're actually using uh, really, really effectively. And when you think about it, when you think about POSIX operating system today, there are a lot of things that, that we take for granted. We have things like pipes, so we can uh, we can pipe data from from one application to to a different application. We've got a file interface, so we know we can we can share information between applications through files. We've got the concept of processes, and we've got the concept of threads and uh, allocating memory, and a bunch of these things which we just use to build our application. And then for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, we can then run those applications across any, any POSIX system, whether that's my, my Mac laptop or it's my Linux server machine. Um, again, you know, there are exceptions. There are some ways in which POSIX has been bent. But that basic idea of having of having just an interface behind which there can be many different implementations of the actual interfaces uh, really, really leads to us to be able to build more applications that we can portable and share. And that's, that's I think, the bigger picture of where I'd really love to see the, the building of distributed systems and, the, and the, the running of distributed systems really go. And I think it's really powerful because today, if you build a distributed system in one organization, like say Yahoo builds Zookeeper, to then go run that in, in another organization, it's a lot of work. It's a ton of work to go figure out how to make this thing work in some other person's setup based on the way that they've actually decided they want to do things. 
Uh, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. And what ends up happening, it's it ends up being enough of a pain in the butt that another organization says, you know what, <laughs> this isn't worth the effort. I'm just going to go ahead and go build my own <laughs> uh, because it turns out that would be easier for me to do is to build my own of this really complicated thing than to actually figure out a way f- for me to be able to, to run this in my own application. And I'm really looking forward to, to a future world where you can build a distributed system in one organization and you can just start running it in another organization as easy as it is to build a Linux app and one company and then just start building that Linux app in a different company. And you can think of all kinds of like great commodification and cost savings and like device agnosticism that comes out of uh, that sort of future. What are the missing pieces? I mean, like, why, what's the disparity between where we are now and that optimistic future? Well, uh, I mean, I'm obviously pretty biased, <laughs> but I, 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 I think what, one of the big ones is really having that, that first abstraction layer that really abstracts away the machines and provides these, these primitives for distributed systems themselves. And that's, that's really what, what, what our goal is with Mesos today, is to be that abstraction layer. So you build all your distributed systems on top of that, and then anybody that's running, running Mesos, you can, they can just take the application that they built in one organization and then just go run it in the other organization that's also running Mesos. So a, a great example of that is one of the distributed systems we, we built on top of Mesos, which is called Kronos. And Kronos is a, a distributed cron. So it's a problem that these days is a big pain point for a lot of folks because they'll go in and they'll set up cron on a couple of machines. And then when that machine fails, they got to go set up on another machine. And it's just, it's a re- really big pain in the butt. So Kronos is, is a solution for that. And it only runs on Mesos. There's no way to run Kronos unless you run it on Mesos. But the great thing about that is that was built at, at Airbnb and they ran it on Mesos. And another organization was able to just launch, sorry, a different organization, which was also running Mesos, was able to just pull down Kronos and just deploy it in their cluster immediately, just run in the cluster immediately. It was like, it was as easy as somebody just downloading some application for their Mac and, or a better example, as easy as somebody downloading an app on their, their iPhone or on Android and just double clicking it and running it. That's incredible. Yeah, and, and, and I think that that's that missing layer, that's that abstraction layer, which really gives people uh, the ability to build these things and then just go run them in their, their data centers. So, so that, I think, is one of the biggest things. I think, though, the second thing is, I mean, getting that is, is, is fantastic, but getting to that place, we really need to continue to, to fill out all the things that are really necessary to build these distributed systems on top of Mesos and make what I was talking about at the beginning of, of this chat really, really easy, right? Uh, you know, the goal of Mesos is to make it easier to build distributed systems by abstracting away tough things like dealing with failures, dealing with actually distributing tasks, dealing with leader election. Uh, and I would say, to be quite honest, that we're not 100% there. You know, we're not at the point where it, it, it is, I mean, it's, it, it's still pretty easy to build Kronos, but we, we need to make it even easier. You know, I, I think the example here is a lot of people don't use threads because uh, it's sort of the lower level, uh, the lower level abstraction. It's the, it's you know, it's a good abstraction to expose, but it's lower level, and you need even higher level abstractions on, on top of threads. And that's one of the things that we're really doing with, with Mesos and at Mesos here today is saying, okay, this is the first step in just making it easier to build the dis- distributed systems by exposing the program, uh, the primitives. But we're going to make it even easier to use those primitives with higher level SDKs and higher level 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 things on top. And I think that's going to make it that's going to make even more people want to build distributed systems on top of something like Mesos, and and then they're going to see the benefits of doing that as well. I can then just take my distributed system that I built here and I can run it someplace else. I, I think a lot of people would be, be really excited about that because you know we're 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 a big hacker community and we like to share the work that we we did and we like to be able to build something and let other people be able to be able to take advantage of it. That's great. So. Um... Where can people go to find out more about Apache Mesos and find out more about you? Yeah, cool. So um, there's a couple places. You can go to mesos.apache.org, which is the uh, the website for the Apache Mesos project. You can also go to mesosphere.com, and we've got a bunch of documentation there. We even expose a lot of um, pre-built packages for Mesos that you can download right from the Mesosphere uh, website. And for me, I would say you can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> My handle is at Ben H, and that's usually a good way to reach out if you're looking to chat with me. Great. Well, Ben Heinemann, thank you so much for coming on Software Engineering Radio. Could have talked to you for another two hours. It's great, <laughs> great material. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been great.
Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can write comments on each episode on the website or write a review on iTunes. Mention or message us on Twitter, at SE Radio, or search for the Software Engineering Radio Group on LinkedIn, Google+, or Facebook. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Thanks again for your support. Thank you.